It's no secret that Intel's brand spanking new 11th gen chips aren't actually all that spanking or all that new. Certain chips went on sale in some regions literally weeks ago, even though they were only supposed to go on sale today. Which is why the legends, or big ol' meanies, according to certain companies like Intel, I'm sure, Gamers Nexus, and a few others already spilled most of the tasty 11th gen beans weeks ago, while I had to sit and wait. But I'm done waiting, boys, and in this video I'll be taking a look at Intel's new Core i7, 11700KF along with Asus's tough gaming Z590 Plus Wi-Fi to see whether Intel will reign once again as the gaming CPU king. But first, you know the drill. If you want to grab any of the parts I'll be mentioning in this video, go ahead and do so via my Amazon affiliate links in the description down below. It helps the channel out and costs you nothing. And for my fellow South Africans, if you're not already buying all of your tech things at Rootwear, then you're just plain unpatriotic. Now, as some of you will remember, I reviewed Intel's last gen 10700KF about 10 months ago, also with an Asus Tough Gaming motherboard, interestingly enough, and I called it the new gaming king. But after that, AMD came in like a big red wrecking ball with their 5000 series CPUs, which matched and even crushed Intel's 10th gen chips in a ton of games. So it is a little concerning then that Intel's new 11th gen chips, or at least the one we're dealing with here, doesn't really seem all that different from the 10700KF. They were built on the same 14 nanometer architecture, they have the same 8 cores with hyperthreading, the same 125 watt TDP, and curiously, the 11700KF advertises lower bass and boost clock speeds than the 10700KF. All while the new chip comes in at around $400, or about 15 to 25 more dollar roonies than the 10700KF. So what the heck is going on here? Well, luckily, even though the two look almost identical at first glance, the 11700KF has more than a few tricks up its sleeve that make it the superior chip in all the ways that matter. One of the biggest being a pretty hefty IPC or instructions per cycle improvement, with the 11th gen seeing a boost to IPC of 19%, at least on the 11900K compared to the 10900K, with presumably the rest of the lineup, including our 11700KF, also seeing a similar upgrade. This is important because even though the 11700KF sports a slightly lower clock speed, the IPC boost means it uses that speed more efficiently, and should result in a decent performance upgrade because of it. IPC improvements are a big part of the reason Team Red's newest chips should be able to trade blows with Intel, even though they usually run at a lower clock speed. Memory is another area where Intel brought some fire with their new chips, bumping the max official supported memory speed to 3200 MHz a sizable improvement over last gen's 2933 MHz. The most crucial of the upgrades coming with this generation is something Intel really dropped the ball on last generation, that being support for PCIe Gen 4. AMD pioneered that shiz ages ago, and it really should have already been a thing on last gen chips. Other notable improvements include a new iGPU, although on the KF chips like the one we're working with here, that's been like ripped out. We also have four more PCIe lanes for 20 in total, new overclocking tools, and some AI improvements. Now that we're acquainted with the chip, we should take a closer look at the board we'll be using to test it, especially since it's probably, maybe, possibly more interesting than the chip itself. In the box, we get the board itself, which we'll ogle in just a bit. Then we have an attachment to the side, which houses the board's Wi-Fi antenna, which should pair well with the Wi-Fi 6 capabilities of the board. Next up is a little book I wouldn't recommend reading as it just kind of looks boring and I'd much rather read The Lost World, which I've been meaning to get to for a very long while now. The Certificate of Reliability Asus ships with the tough boards is definitely a bit of a better read and tells you all about how tough it is, which is, yeah, kind of cool. Then we have some more stickers for your collection of stickers that I hope you never actually stick on to any of your PC parts. On a serious note, even though I never use these things, they're still kind of cool to look at. So like maybe I'll start a collection, who knows. Then we've got an M.2 rubber pad or two, another branded coaster for my collection, a couple of M.2 screws, and then two SATA cables to bring it all home before we get to the board itself. Now, like I mentioned earlier, this isn't my first time laying hands on an Intel version of a tough gaming board. And just like the Strix Z590 I checked out very recently, look different, but still same to the Z490 Strix, the Z490 and Z590 tough gaming boards are also different, but still same. The tough gaming Z590 Plus again sticks with a whole gray and black color scheme, one that's only really interrupted by white and gray logos or wordy things. While I didn't mind the color scheme or the look of the Z490 tough in general, in fact, I didn't think it looked half bad at all. 
I did have some issues with it. Issues that Asus has apparently taken into account and changed on the Z590 top. Most notably, there's a very noticeable reduction of yellow accents on the board. I mean, there's like at least 70% less yellow there. Even though I thought it added a bit of character to the Z490, it stood out a little more than I would have liked. So only having a tiny yellow accent on the Z590 right next to the CPU socket where it'll be like covered up by a cooler is a smart move, Asus. Beyond that, the Z590 as a whole just looks much better than the board it's replacing. Due to the included M.2 heat spreader, which we'll get to in just a minute, and a few other tweaks like an extended I.O. cover and heatsink, the board looks a hell of a lot cleaner and less busy. And I honestly think it looks kind of fantastic. The only thing I'm not too big a fan of is the design of the chipset heatsink. It looks sort of like futuristic, like some sort of stealth bomber spaceship thing, but it just doesn't fit the aesthetic of the rest of the like board, in my opinion. And unfortunately for the RGB nuts like myself, there's not much to write home about here with the tough Z590 also only featuring two somewhat cute little lighting zones on the right of the board. Even though they're customizable through Asus's Aura software, they're just not very exciting or creative. What is exciting is that the board is currently selling for $260, with no pricing here for us in South Africa because I can't actually find the thing being sold anywhere. Anyway, that price makes it a very competitive Z590 indeed, especially with everything it has to offer. Kicking things off, we've got a beefy 14 plus 2 power phase design, just like on the Strix Z590, although there are probably some quality and efficiency differences between the two. But regardless, that means that the board should be able to handle pretty much any 10th or 11th gen chip you can throw at it. It can also handle almost any memory kit you toss its way, unless it's ECC memory, obviously, as the board, thanks to Asus's Optum M2 tech, can handle kits with overclock speeds of up to 5133 MHz. Cooling is another area that's gone through an impressive glow up from the previous generation, with much bigger heat sinks for the board's VRM and chokes, and a nice hunk of metal to keep the chipset cool too. Adding even more metal to the board, we also have two hefty heat spreaders, one dedicated to the topmost M.2 drive, and a really like long boy at the bottom covering the two bottom M.2 slots. Oh yeah, that's right, the board features support for three M.2 drives, which is awesome. Although only the topmost slot is wired for PCIe Gen 4, with the two at the bottom being wired for PCIe Gen 3. Along with all that, the board also focuses heavily on impressive audio hardware and features like AI noise cancellation, all of which provide a great experience and are like a nice to have. But it's not nearly as big of a selling point to me as I'm sure Asus wants it to be. With this being a tough board, you'd expect it to be pretty tough. And it definitely is. The board is built from the ground up for stability and toughness, and the premium, reinforced, shielded, military-grade parts everywhere shows it. I didn't take the board into the wilds of Africa, also known as my backyard, to truly test the toughness, but I'm sure it'll survive just fine. And just fine is about what I'd say about the board's rear I.O. It features all of the usual suspects, including audio jacks, display port, and HDMI ports, and all of that jazz. But more importantly, it's equipped with the Wi-Fi 6 connectors, a 2.5 gigabit Ethernet port, and a total of seven USB ports. The USB ports include a mix of 2.0, 3.2 Gen 1 and 2, and a single Type-C port. And that's more than enough for most people. But I'm not most people, and I need me some more USB ports. Luckily, along with a long list of other things I don't have time to really get into, the board's internal I.O. configuration comes packed with a bunch more USB connectors, including a Thunderbolt header, as well as six SATA ports, four RGB headers, a clear CMOS header, and a strange array of fan connectors. Strange because even though the board has six like headers in total, only three of those are chassis fan headers, which is not nearly enough, Asus. I mean, sure, I can plug chassis fans into some of the other headers, and yes, I do have fan splitter cables, but still, I'm mad at it purely out of principle. Now, with all that talk out of the way, it's finally time for some action. That's right, it's benchmark time. Now, there are a couple of things to note here before we get started. And the first is that I only have numbers for the 11700KF, 10900K, and AMD's 3800XC because they're the only CPUs I had access to. I'm sure if I had access to a 5000 series Ryzen chip, it would definitely skew the results so do keep that in mind. Secondly, while I usually run my kit of Crucial Ballistics RGB at 3600 MHz for benchmarks like this, because of the way Intel's new chips operate with regards to memory, 
I found 3200 megahertz to produce significantly higher results. Gamers Nexus covers this topic in a video, which I'll link down below. As for the system we're using, we have the aforementioned 32 gigabyte kit of Crucial Ballistics RGB, a 360 millimeter AIO handling our cooling, Antex EAG Pro 750 watt covering our power needs, the Sabrent Rocket PCIe 4.0 drive I picked up at Woodware, and for our GPU, we've got an RTX 3070 doing all the heavy lifting. Oh, and I didn't overclock any of the chips for this round of benchmarks, but I did leave on all enhancements like Asus's MCE, since that's what it defaulted to, and is something I'd imagine most of you would leave enabled too. So also keep that in mind. So as with any good review, we kick things off with Cinebench, which paints a fairly predictable picture. The 10900K with its extra cores came out on top when it comes to multi-threaded workloads, but surprisingly, the 11700KF almost kept up with it. And when it comes to the single threaded test, the 11th gen chip from Intel really flexes that IPC gain muscles, handily outperforming both of the other chips. Blender, which likes as many cores as it can get, unsurprisingly heavily favors the higher core count 10900K, while both 3800XC and 11700KF put up a pretty good fight. Switching to more gaming oriented tests, we've got Superposition up first. And here's where things get a little interesting with the 10900K dropping to the back of the pack with the 3800XC taking the lead and the 11700KF landing right in the middle. In 3 Mark's Time Spy, we see things shake up yet again, this time with the 3800XC posting the lowest CPU score, the 11700KF coming in second place, and the 10900K coming out on top. As for actual gaming benchmarks, first up is Civilization 6, where average turn time is king, and here we start to see the 11700K slowly coming into its own. Then we've got Cyberpunk 2077, where our two previous gen chips posted scarily similar FPS numbers, with the 11700KF edging out the lead. Then in Hitman 3, we have a much clearer win for the 11700KF, a win that more or less sets the tone for the rest of the games I tested, where the 11700KF came out on top in all of them, except for Apex Legends. The 11700KF's lead obviously varies quite a bit with each game tested, where in some it just barely comes out on top and in others it clearly dominates, but wins are wins and the chip showing here is pretty impressive. It's because of this impressive showing that I wish I was able to get my hands on a 5800X for this comparison, because I'm really curious to see how the 11700KF would fare against that beast in my testing. During stock testing, I saw the 11700KF hit a max power draw of 166 watts, which translated to a max temp of 85 degrees with a controlled ambient temp of 23 degrees, which is actually not bad at all, especially with the chip maxing out at an all core clock of 4.6 gigahertz and a single core max clock of five gigahertz. The board's beefy VRM heatsink also did a fantastic job of keeping things cool with those temps only hitting a max of 54 degrees. In order to really put the chip and our tough gaming Z590 through their paces, I also tried my hand at a bit of overclocking. And after a bit of tweaking, I got the chip to stick to a stable all-core overclock of 5 GHz. And man, did those two make a great pair. I'm only showing a handful of benchmarks and only comparisons to the 11700KF because this video is already way longer than it should be, and I didn't get to overclocking the other chips, so including those just wouldn't be fair. But holy crap, did that OC do some work. In Cinebench, I got the highest single core score I've ever personally gotten. And even though it's not on the chart, the multi-threaded score even beat out the stock 10900K score. When it comes to the games I tested, the difference was far less pronounced, with some games barely benefiting at all from the OC, while others saw a pretty sizable uplift, including Civilization VI, which reduced its average turn time by around 11%. This isn't an overclock I'd stick to for everyday use, as I'd much rather set a per core overclock for that, and here's why. With the 5 GHz all core OC applied, the chip was guzzling down a massive 281 watts under load, and easily hit 100 degrees on the core, while our VRM temps were surprisingly still very manageable at like 65 degrees. All in all, an impressive showing from both Intel and Asus. So what's the verdict here then? Has Intel ripped back their gaming CPU crown from AMD's clutches? Well, unfortunately, I can't really answer that question since I don't have a 5000 series chip to test myself. But others like Gamers Nexus did. And from what I've seen from them and others, that's a big old... sort of. But not real. It seems like Intel and AMD are about evenly matched in most games, 
with a slight advantage still going to Team Red, which is honestly really disappointing. Intel has been sort of stagnating for years now on an old architecture, squeezing every last drop of performance they can out of 14 nanometer, and AMD has proven that that's just not cutting it anymore. Intel has to bring more to the table than they are right now, and we as consumers need them to. Or we might see AMD starting to do the same thing moving forward. As for the top gaming Z590 though, I'm almost all for it. I would have liked to see more USB ports and fan headers, either some more or no RGB at all, and an onboard power slash reset switch, or at least a debug LED tossed into the mix. But overall, it's a fantastic board. And that's all folks. Again, if you're planning on picking up any of the parts I mentioned in this video, be sure to use my Amazon affiliate links down below, or if you're in South Africa, grab it all at Woodware. Huge thanks to Asus South Africa for lending me the board and chip for this review, and thanks to everyone who stuck around this far into the video. I know it's a long boy. Now, I've been working on videos for like 27 hours straight at this point, so uh, I'm gonna go destroy my bed. I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.